let's get to the fun part. Let's talk about string theory. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's uh, discuss some technical basics of uh, string theory. What is string theory? What is a string? How many dimensions are we talking about? What are the different states? <laughs> yeah. How do we represent the elementary particles and uh, the laws of physics using this new framework? So string theory uh, is the idea that the fundamental entities are not particles, but extended higher dimensional objects like one dimensional strings, like loops. These loops could be open like uh, with two ends, like an interval or a circle without any ends. So, and they're vibrating and moving around in space. So how big they are? Well, you can of course stretch it and make it big, or you can just let it be whatever it wants. It can be as small as a point because the circle can shrink to a point and be very light, or you can you know, stretch it and it becomes very massive, or it could oscillate and become massive that way. So it depends on which kind of state you have. In fact, the string, can have infinitely many modes, depending on which kind of oscillation it's doing. Like a guitar has different harmonics, string has different harmonics, but for the string, each harmonic is a particle. So each particle will give you, ah, this is a more massive harmonic, <laughs> this is a less massive. So the lightest harmonic, so to speak, is no harmonics, which means like the string shrunk to a point, mm -hmm. and then it becomes like a massless particles or light particles like photon and graviton and so forth. So when, sh when you look at, tiny strings, which are shrunk to a point, the lightest ones, they look like the particles that we, we think of. they're like particles. In other words, from far away, they look like a point. But of course, if you zoom in, there's this tiny little, you know, little circle that's there, that's shrunk to a, almost a point. Should we be imagining, this is through the visual intuition, should we be imagining literally strings that are potentially connected as a loop or not? When you, and when somebody outside of physics is imagining a basic element of string theory, which is a string. Should we literally be thinking about a string? Yes, you should literally think about string, but string with zero thickness. With zero thickness. So in other words, it's a, it's a, it's a loop of energy, so to speak, mm -hmm. if you can think of it that way. And so there's a tension like a regular string. If you pull it, there's, you, know, you, have to, you have to stretch it, but it's not like a thickness, like you're made of something, it's just energy. It's not made of atoms or something like that. But, and it is very, very tiny. Very tiny. Much smaller than uh, elementary particles of physics. Much smaller. So we think if you let the string to be by itself, the lowest state, there will be like a fuzziness or a size of that tiny little circle, which is like a point. Mm -hmm. About, could be anything between, we don't know the exact size, but in different models have different sizes, but something of the order of 10 to the minus, let's say 30 centimeters. So 10 to the minus 30 centimeters, just to compare with the size of the atom, which is 10 to the minus eight centimeters, is 22 orders of magnitude smaller. So, so it's- Unimaginably small, it's I would very, say. Small, very small. So we, we basically think from far away, string is like a point particle. Yeah. And that's why a lot of the things that we learned about point particle physics carries over directly to strings. Mm -hmm. So therefore there's not, not much of a mystery why particle physics was successful because a string is like a particle when it's not stretched. But it turns out having this size, being able to oscillate, get bigger, turned out to be resolving these puzzles that Feynman was having in calculating his diagrams, and it gets rid of those infinities. So when you're trying to do those infinities, the regions that give infinities to Feynman, as soon as you get to those regions, then this string starts to oscillate, and these oscillation structure of the strings resolves those infinities to finite answer at the end. So the size of the string, the fact that it's one dimensional, gives a finite answer at the end, resolves this paradox. Mm -hmm. Now, perhaps it's also useful to recount of how string theory came to be. Yes. Because it wasn't like somebody say, well, let me solve the problem of Einstein's, uh, so solve the problem that Feynman had with unifying Einstein's theory with quantum mechanics by replacing the point by a string. No, that's not the way the thought process. The thought process was much more random. Physicist, Veneziano in this case, was trying to describe the interactions they were seeing in colliders, in, in accelerators. Mm -hmm. And they were seeing that some process, in some process when two particles came together and joined together and went they were separately in one way and the opposite way, they behaved the same way. In some way there was a symmetry a duality, which he didn't understand. The particles didn't seem to have that symmetry. 
He said, I don't know what it is. What's the reason that these colliders and experiments we're doing seems to have the symmetry, but let me write a mathematical formula which exhibits that symmetry. He used gamma functions, beta functions, and all that, you know, complete math, no physics, other than trying to get symmetry out of his equation. He just wrote down a formula as the answer for a process, mm -hmm. not, not a method to compute it. Just say, wouldn't it be nice if this was the answer? <laughs> yes. Physicists looked at this one, hmm, that's intriguing. It has the symmetry, all right, but what is this? Where is this coming from? Which, which kind of physics gives you this? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. A few years later, people saw that, oh, the equation that you're writing, the process that you're writing in the intermediate channels that particles come together seems to have all the harmonics. Mm -hmm. Harmonics sounds like a string. Let me see if what you're describing has anything to do with the strings. And people try to see if what he's doing has anything to do with the strings. They say, oh, yeah, indeed. If I study scattering of two strings, I get exactly the formula you wrote down. That was the reinterpretation of what he had written in the formula as a strings, but still had nothing to do with gravity. It had nothing to do with resolving the problems of gravity with quantum mechanics. It was just trying to explain a process that people were seeing in hadronic physics collisions. So it took a, f a few more years to get to that point. They, they, they noticed that, uh, physicists noticed that whenever you try to find the spectrum of strings, you always get a massless particle, which has exactly the properties that the graviton is supposed to have. And no particle in hadronic physics that had that property you are getting a massless graviton as part of this scattering without looking for it. It was forced on you. People were not trying to solve quantum gravity. Quantum gravity was pushed on them. <laughs> I don't want this graviton. Get rid of it. They couldn't get rid of it. They gave up trying to get rid of it. Physicists said, Shirk and Short said, you know what? String theory is theory of quantum gravity. They changed the perspective altogether. We are not describing the hadronic physics. We are describing this theory of quantum gravity. And that's when string theory probably got uh, like uh, exciting that this could be the unifying theory. Exactly, it got exciting, but at the same time, not so fast. Namely, it should have been fast, but it wasn't because particle physics through quantum field theory were so successful at that time. This is mid seventies, standard model of physics, electromagnetism and unification of electromagnetic forces with all the other forces were beginning to take place without the gravity part. Everything was working beautifully for particle physics. And so that was the shining golden age of quantum field theory and all the experiments, standard model, this and that, unification and spontaneous symmetry breaking was taking place. All of them was nice. This was kind of like a sideshow and nobody was paying so much attention. This exotic string is needed for quantum gravity. Ah, uh, maybe there's other ways, maybe we should do something else. So anyway, it wasn't paid much attention to. And uh, this took a little bit more effort to try to actually connect it to, to re reality. There were a few more steps. First of all, there was a puzzle that you were getting extra dimensions. String was not working well with three spatial dimensions at one time. It needed extra dimension. Now. Uh, there are different versions of strings, but the version that ended up being related to, to having particles like electron, what we call fermions, needed 10 dimensions, what we call super string. Now, why super? Why the word super? It turns out this, uh, this version of the string, which had fermions, had an extra symmetry, which we call supersymmetry. This is a symmetry between a particle and another particle with exactly the same properties, same mass, same charge, et cetera. The only difference is that one of them has a little different spin than the other one. And one of, and one of them is a boson, one of them is a fermion because of that shift of spin. Otherwise they're identical. So there was this symmetry. String theory had the symmetry. In fact, supersymmetry was discovered through string theory, theoretically. So theoretically, the first place that this was observed when, when you were describing these fermionic strings. So that was the beginning of the study of supersymmetry was the via string theory. And then it, it had remarkable properties that you know the symmetry meant and so forth that people began studying supersymmetry after that. And that was continuous, that was a kind of a tangent direction at the beginning for string theory. But people in particle physics started also thinking, oh, supersymmetry is great. Let's see if we can have supersymmetry in particle physics and so forth. Forget about strings and they developed on a different track as well. Supersymmetry in different models became a subject on its own right, understanding supersymmetry and what does this mean? Mm -hmm. Because it unified bosons and fermions, unified some ideas together. So photon is a boson, electron is a fermion. Could things like that be somehow related? Mm -hmm. 
Mm. It was a kind of a natural kind of a question to try to kind of unify because in physics we love unification. Now, gradually string theory was beginning to show signs of unification. It had graviton, but people found that you also have things like photons in them. Different excitations of string behave like photons. Another one behaved like electron. So a single string was unifying all these particles into one object. That's remarkable. It's in 10 dimensions though. <laughs> it is not our universe because we live in three plus one dimension. How yes. could that be possibly true? Yes. So this was a conundrum. It was elegant, it was beautiful, but it was very specific about which dimension you're getting, which structure you're getting. It wasn't saying, oh, you just put D equals to four, you'll get your space-time dimension that you want. No, it didn't like that. It said, I want 10 dimensions. And that's the way it is. So it was very specific. Now, so people try to reconcile this by the idea that, you know, maybe these extra dimensions are tiny. So if you take three macroscopic spatial dimensions at one time and six extra tiny spatial dimensions, like tiny spheres or tiny circles, then it avoids contradiction with manifest fact that we haven't seen extra dimensions in experiments today. So that was a way to avoid conflict. Now, this was a way to avoid conflict, but it was not observed in experiments. A string observed in experiments? No, because it's so small. Mm -hmm. So it's beginning to sound a little bit funny. Similar feeling to the way perhaps Dirac had felt about this positron, plus or minus. You know, it was beginning to sound a little bit like, oh yeah, not only I have to have 10 dimension, but I also have to this, I have to also this. And, and so you, so conservative physicists would say, hmm, you know, I haven't seen these in experiments. I don't know if they are really there. Are you pulling my leg? I, do you want me to imagine things that are not there? So this was an attitude of some physicists to, towards string theory, despite the fact that the puzzle of gravity and quantum mechanics merging together work, mm -hmm. but still was this skepticism. You're putting the, all these things like you want me to imagine there are these extra dimensions that I cannot see, uh-huh, uh-huh. And you want me to believe that string that you have not even seen experiments are real, uh-huh, okay, what else do you want me to believe? <laughs> so it was kind of beginning to sound a little funny. Now, I will, I will pass forward, forward a little bit further. Um, a few decades later, when string theory became the mainstream of efforts mm -hmm. to unify the forces and particles together, we learned that these extra dimensions actually solve problems. It, they weren't a nuisance the, the way they originally appeared. First of all, the properties of these extra dimensions reflected the number of particles we got in four dimensions. If you took these six dimensions to have like six, five holes or four holes, it tend to change the number of particles that you see in four dimensional space time. Mm -hmm. You get one electron and one muon if you had this, but if you did the other J shape, you get something else. So mm -hmm. geometrically, you could get different kinds of physics. So it was kind of an, a mirroring of geometry by physics down in the macroscopic space. So these extra dimensions were becoming useful. Fine, but we didn't need the extra dimensions to just write an electron in three dimensions. We did we wrote it, so what so what? Was there any other puzzle? Yes, there were. Hawking. Hawking had been studying black holes in the mid-70s, uh, following the work of Bekenstein, who had predicted that black holes have entropy. So Bekenstein had tried to attach the entropy to the black hole. If you throw something into the black hole, the entropy seems to go down because you had something entropy in, outside the black hole and you throw it. Entropy was, black hole was unique, so the entropy did not have any, black hole had no entropy. So you seem, the entropy seemed to go down. And so that's against the laws of thermodynamics. So Bekenstein was trying to say, no, no, therefore black hole must have an entropy. So he was trying to understand that he found that if you assigned entropy to, the, uh, to be proportional to the area of the black hole, it seems to work. And then Hawking found not only that's correct, he found the correct proportionality factor of factor of a one quarter of the area and Planck units is the correct amount of entropy. And he gave an argument using quantum semi-classical arguments, which barely, which means basically using a little bit of a quantum mechanics because he didn't have the full quantum mechanics of string theory. He could do some aspects of approximate quantum arguments. So heuristic quantum arguments led to this entropy form formula. But then he didn't answer the following question. He was getting a big entropy for the black hole. The black hole with the size of the horizon of a black hole is huge, has a huge amount of entropy. What are the microstates of this entropy? When you say, for example, the gas is entropy, you count where the atoms are, you count this, this bucket or that bucket, there's that information about there and so on, you count them. 
For the black hole, the way Hawking was thinking, there was no degree of freedom. You throw them in and there was just one solution. So where are these entropy? What are, what are these microscopic states? They were hidden somewhere. So later in string theory, uh, the work that uh, we did with my colleague Strominger, in particular, showed that these ingredients in string theory of black hole arise from the extra dimensions. So the degrees of freedom are, are hidden in terms of things like strings, wrapping these extra circles in these hidden dimensions. And then we started counting how many ways like the strings can wrap around this circle and the extra dimension or that circle and counted the microscopic degrees of freedom. And lo and behold, we got the microscopic degrees of freedom that Hawking was predicting four dimensions. So the extra dimensions became useful <laughs> for resolving a puzzle in four dimensions. The puzzle was where are the degrees of freedom of the black hole hidden? The answer, hidden in the extra dimensions, the tiny extra dimensions. So then by this time, it was beginning to, to we see aspects mm -hmm. that extra dimensions are useful for many things. It's not a nuisance. It wasn't to be kind of, you know, be ashamed of. It was actually in the welcome features. New feature, nevertheless.